Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. Manage your blood glucose levels, increase your possibilities. By Jivo Kaipo Pen, the first premixed auto injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, when you're a national leader on diabetes and you really seem to listen to patients and you deliver on some big ideas, you get our attention. Dr. Partha Carr says it shouldn't be that unusual. And I also feel that clinicians sometimes believe that people living with type 1 diabetes won't be able to handle the truth, so to speak. Oh, you can't tell them. Well, you can. Uh, They're all adults or surrounded by adults, and they deal with tough calls in their lives all the time, you know? Dr. Carr is the diabetes co-lead of NHS England. Yes, this is a U.S.-centric show, but I've followed him on social media for a long time, and I love what he has to say. We'll talk about access, getting more out of your doctor's visits, and what he sees in the future of diabetes tech. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I am your host, Stacey Sims, and we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. If you're part of our mostly American audience, I hope you had a really good Thanksgiving. I hope the travel was safe. If you had to go anywhere, I hope the food was great. I hope the family was okay, too. (laughs) Really, I hope you had a great holiday. If you're part of our international audience, which is, is still pretty big, I would expect it to be bigger this week just because of who we're talking to. And that is Dr. Partha Carr, National Specialty Advisor for Diabetes with NHS England. And this is one of those times where I just was interested to see what somebody had to say. As I mentioned in that the opening tease, I followed him online for quite a while. And I thought you might be interested as well. And boy, when I put it in the Facebook group, you all were thrilled. So I, I hope you enjoy the interview. He didn't have a ton of time to talk to me, but that is to be expected. But I'm, I'm really happy with the questions I was able to ask and, you know, just the fact that he was able to share some information with us, even though his, his health system is, is markedly, you know, different than ours here in the States. Before we jump in, I do want to take a moment. This is a little self promoting but gosh, guys, I got such exciting news recently. And that is that I won this huge book prize. <laughs> yes, I know the book came out a while ago, but I won Best New Nonfiction in the American Book Fest. This was, of course, for the world's worst diabetes mom, real life stories of raising a child with type 1 diabetes. And it kind of took me, didn't kind of, it really took me by surprise. I had entered it earlier this year. I had forgotten about it. When we got the email, my publisher kind of emailed me quickly and said, you know, being a finalist is really nice. And then she said, no, no, wait a minute, you won. (laughs) That was kind of my reaction too, was laughing. But I won. So I know you're asking, okay, The World's Worst Diabetes Mom came out in 2019. How did we win an award in 2021? The uh, Book Fest, the American Book Fest Awards are kind of rolling. So you're eligible for almost three years. So this year's books were from uh, certain dates in 21, 2020, and 2019. This was our first time entering the book, and it was actually our last chance to enter. So boy, I'm so excited. I'm really proud of the book. And I have some news coming in December. I have some more book news that was already planned before this award. But thank you for letting me indulge and do a little patting myself on the back. It was not easy to write and get it out and do everything we needed to do for it. And boy, you all have been so supportive considering I haven't been able to do any kind of book tour at all, right? I mean, it came out at the end of 2019. I think I went to two or three places and that was it. And just like everybody else in 2020, it hasn't been the same since. I'm hardly alone in that. So more book news coming up. And Dr. Partha Carr in just a moment. I should probably tell you just a little bit more about him if you're not familiar. He has been a consultant in diabetes and endocrinology on the national level there in the UK since 2008, Uh, clinical director of diabetes from 2009 to 2015. And here's the full title, National Specialty Advisor, Diabetes with NHS England. And there are so many things that uh, he's been involved with. Most recently, uh, very prominently, uh, getting the Freestyle Libre being available across the country over there. And I will we'll talk about that specifically. Being very involved in language matters, getting CGM available to all T1D pregnant patients. And he hinted that a big announcement was coming. 
Well, that turned out to be, that it was pretty big, that all people with type 1 diabetes in England will be covered for CGM, for Dexcom or for the Libre, for a flash CGM. There's a lot of detail, of course, on that. And he wrote up a great blog post explaining it all. I'm going to link to that in the show notes, which you can always find at the episode homepage at diabetes-connections.com. Okay, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Gvoc Hypopen. Almost everybody who takes insulin has experienced a low blood sugar, and that can be scary. A very low blood sugar is really scary, and that's where Gvoc Hypopen comes in. Gvoc is the first auto-injector to treat very low blood sugar. Gvoc Hypopen is pre-mixed and ready to go with no visible needle. That means it's easy to use. How easy is it? You pull off the red cap and push the yellow end onto bare skin and hold it for five seconds. That's it. Find out more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Gvoc logo. Gvoc shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvocglucagon.com slash risk. Martha Carr, welcome to Diabetes Connections. Thanks so much for making some time for me and my listeners. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for asking. I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous. I'm a huge fan, uh, just following you on social media. And then I put into my Facebook group, like I always do, uh, you know, do you have any questions for this guest? We've got a part of the car coming up. I have very few questions from the group, but I have lots of, oh my gosh, I love him. Tell him we love him. Tell him thank you, thank you. And I'll, I'll tell you specifically why they're thanking you in a moment. But you do have a, a quite a big fan club over here. So going in, I guess I'm trying to butter you up, but going in, you should know that. <laughs> No, it's, it's very kind, very kind. Uh, I always see it as, you know, at the end of the day, it's my job to do as well. But, you know, the the love and blessings you get is just makes it stronger. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me just start off by asking you, you do not live with diabetes. How did you get into the position that you are in today? Why this field for you? So I think uh, a lot of it was, uh, you know, when we are when we are training, you pick your subjects as you go along. And then I, I sort of gravitated towards diabetes and endocrinology. Because I thought that was an opportunity here to talk to a lot of people, you know, be a part of their journey throughout life. That was quite good. And I like talking. And then sort of more towards type one, because I think I get to, got to realize the more senior I got that a lot of attention, quite understandably, was into type two diabetes. And that's, you know, the bigger volume number, et cetera. But I think what I found that there's not a lot of things being done for type one as a trade back of that. So it's been more of a, uh, let's see what we can do in this space. Let's try and help people. And I think just being an advocate, so to speak. So yeah, that, that's probably how it's graduated over the course of time. One of the things that we've observed just following your social media here in the US is the adoption and use of Libre for many more people. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? So I think uh, Libra, I mean, Freestyle Libra first came into the market on 2014, 2015. And I think it started to sort of gradually make its way into the UK setting and the sort of people would buy it, fund it. And I think it sort of started taking off in 2016, 2017. And that's when I sort of got into the job. And for me, people have always asked, you know, why this particular device? I think it's not the device. I think it's more of a mass device. And I think there will be more competition coming along. But to me, it's be a very good example of what self-management can do. I mean, simply put, if you see more of your numbers and more of your trends, you tend to intervene more and do better. So that's been the device. And it's been a battle to try and get it into people's lives as you go along. As you, The system here is slightly different. You have to justify every single thing you do uh, because you're saying, well, this is why we're trying to do it. And it's a funny place to be in because you, you know you're you're sort of fighting, so to speak, against other conditions. And that doesn't feel right either. It's trying to justify why you needed more compared to X or Y. And I think that's the challenge. And then people start looking at, well, actually, if there isn't a randomized control trial which showed Y or Z, then I can't fund it. And then you try and explain to people it's not just about the RCTs or the randomized control trials all the time. It's not just about your A1C. It's about the quality of life and what it does do. So yeah, I think I think that's how it came about. And then driving it through pick up or take up around the country, sort of battling with regions. So yeah, it's 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 been a journey and a half, so to speak. Can you get a little bit more specific in terms of how many people now in your system do have access and do use the Freestyle Libre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we got, I mean, give a round figure wise, we got about 200, we got a quarter of a million people with type 1 diabetes. And I think about 53% of them are on it right now across the country. And if all our cards land well, I think it should be available either, you know, Libra or its equivalent should be available to everybody, everybody very soon. 
So Yeah, I mean, the reason I wanted to ask that is because, first of all, it's already such a, a big number, comparatively speaking, to much mm -hmm. of the rest of the world, certainly. I've got to imagine you're starting to see better outcomes, too. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's coming through. Your H1, HB1Cs are better. I mean, I can tell you from my own clinical practice, people, there are huge changes. We're seeing it across the country in the data we're collecting. And guess what? Admission levels are down. People feel happier. Your HB1C is down. It's doing what it says on the tin. What would be the ultimate goal? Is it with that device? Is it then moving on to other CGMs? Or do you want to kind of get as many yeah. people as possible in this one? Oh, no, absolutely. I've always maintained, I mean, Libra or Freestyle Libra is the, has been the tip of the spare. I think there was a lot of things there which was about showing people the, what is possible because before that, in the world of the NHS, technology has always been seen as a, okay, well, let's see what we can do. I mean, for example, insulin pumps have been around for so long. We even had nice guidance on it available since 2008, but the pickup rate, really low, 15%, 16%, due to many, many reasons behind it. And CGM, for example, traditional CGM like Dexcom, really low again, 4%, 5% or thereabouts. But I think this was about showing what could be done if you really pushed on it hard. And I think it's opened up many, many doors. You know, subsequently, because of that, we're looking at competition coming along. We're looking at every single pregnancy with type 1 diabetes now having access to a Dexcom or a Medtronic device. We're doing trials in closed loop. Suddenly, it, it has become a flagship of, and due to luck, serendipity, or default, uh, it's worked out as one of the projects which has really, really played out well in the NHS. And uh, so a lot of people are looking at it. And for me, that was always the purpose. It's a tip of the spare. If you can show you can do it with one, there's no reason you can't. And it, it, it's definitely not the end goal, never has been. I think the end goal would be that every every person with type 1 diabetes, irrespective of your age, has the ability to choose whatever technology they so can, whether it's a flash, whether it's a traditional CGM, whether it's a pump or whether it's a closed loop. That's what it should Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And just a little bit more about the Libre. I'm curious too, obviously the biggest objection many people would have had would have been cost. Yeah. But inside your organization or external critics, what were their objections thinking going into something like this? I think the NHS always is a very traditional setup. And I think they're very good when it comes to drugs. So pharmaceutical products, for example, pharmaceutical companies will do massive randomized control trials to show, okay, here is the drop in HbA1c and thereby you can calculate it. The problem is with technology companies, they necessarily haven't done that. So if you look at Freestyle Libra and the initial studies that came out, they never showed any change in hba one c primarily because they chose a lot of people whose hba one c was excellent to begin with. And you're sitting there going like, well, that was a mistake, I think, for companies not to take up the trials because straight away to a lot of policymakers, you don't have any room to maneuver because you're banking yourself completely on the ability that it will show improvement of hypos and quality of life. Now, the other problem, I suspect, has been that NICE, which is our governing body, so to speak, who, you know, looks at evidence, they're quite slow at coming off the blocks. Sometimes they can be too late. In the technology world, by the time you assess, you know, right now, if they're assessing Libra 1, you've got Libra 1, 2, 3 out. So what mm -hmm. are you assessing? It's got to be nimble and quick. And that's been, that was the obstacle, people saying that. So I think there were that level of obstacle, well, NICE haven't said so, so why should be? There was also a lot of people who fundamentally believed that this was just a gizmo and uh, this was just a shiny toy and we shouldn't give it to people with diabetes. They should, or for example, they had to earn it. You know, they, they had to either have complications to have it or they should be testing 10 times a day to get it, which I think is pretty silly because, you know, the whole point of doing this exercise is to target people who are finding it difficult to test to find giving it to people who, to stop them from having complications. But there you go. It's a very traditional set of thinking, which is what has been the challenge trying to break through. Yeah. We have uh, similar issues in the States where they're doing trials and you always see like, well, their A1C went from 7.3 to 6.9 and that's wonderful. But, yeah. you know, we need to reach the people whose A1Cs are 10.5, 100%, right? 100%. Because of either education or access or whatever it is. I know, I know you're struggling with that as well. Yeah. No. So for example, you know, we have learned from that, you know, we, when we collected the real world data with Libra, we showed exactly what you said. The higher you, the higher your starting age, B one C, the better your outcomes. And you go like, well, that's obvious. So what we're doing with close, you know, so what you're doing with closed loops right now? So we're running a real world uh, trial evaluation throughout the country. It's about thirty four five centers around the country, adults and pediatrics doing it. And guess what we're seeing? Again, the higher your A one C, the better your flattening of your A one C. So it's not rocket science. And I always am flabbergasted when people doing trials go like, no, let's just pick the people whose control are really good. And as you said, but that goes against the whole deprivation thing that we discuss about, because 
we know people who come from a very deprived background will have worse control. So if you really want to tackle deprivation, you need to control that and you need to tackle that. So the thinking needs to be far more refined than what it is at the present moment. And hopefully we're trying to show some ways of doing so. So one of my listeners said, I want you to please let uh, Partha Carr know how much I appreciate his posts. She goes on to say, there's not much I appreciate more than medical professionals who treat us like real people and don't talk down to us. Where did you learn your bedside manner, your style, or what, you know, what we as, as not your patients see on social media? Because that's one of the things I think that very much resonates with people is that you're, you're very plain spoken and you don't talk down to people with diabetes. Right back to our conversation. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. And, you know, over the years, I find we manage diabetes better when we're thinking less about all the stuff of diabetes tasks. That's why I love partnering with people who take the load off on things like ordering supplies so I can really focus on Benny. The Dario Diabetes Success Plan is all about you. All the strips and lancets you need delivered to your door, one-on-one coaching so you can meet your milestones, weekly insights into your trends with suggestions for how to succeed, get the diabetes management plan that works with you and for you. Dario's published studies demonstrate high-impact clinical results. Find out more, go to mydario.com forward slash diabetes dash connections. Now back to Dr. Carr talking about how he has developed a good bedside manner and respect for his patients. I think it's come with time, if I'm very honest. It's not like, it's not like I suddenly woke out of bed and one day I decided to become like this. And I think what I've realized over the course of time is that medical school doesn't teach us consultation skills. It teaches, it teaches a lot of stuff, right? It just teaches us what the books say, it teaches us about insulin physiology, how it works. It doesn't really teach us a lot about interaction with human beings, which is what we did with some things like the language matters and stuff. And mm. people found language matters interesting. I found that just human sense, you know, common sense. I mean, it's not that difficult to be nice to people. And we somehow are not. We somehow, and I think social media teaches me a lot of stuff. I think my patients teach me a lot. And I don't say that in a really glib way because things like, you know, I would do transitional or young adults clinic. And I remember these words from this young girl who sat there, looked at me and said, it feels like an exam sometimes, you know? And I wonder, why is that? And then she said, uh, I don't know. It just feels like I'm going to be asked what I'm doing, be judged by what I'm doing. You know, and I sat there and go like, that's not right. That's wrong. Why are we making people feel like that way? And then we are wondering why they're not coming back to our clinics. So a lot of my consultations, if I'm very honest, are not about diabetes with my patients. They're very much about, could be a football, could be a movies. I mean, yesterday I went to watch The Eternals and today in clinic, we were talking about one of my patients and that was the conversation. What did you think about that bit? The post credits, what was it? And I think you build a rapport with people. They trust you more, you get along more. So I, I like to keep it very plain. And I also feel that clinicians sometimes believe that people living with type 1 diabetes won't be able to handle the truth, so to speak. Uh, oh, you can't tell them. Well, you can. Uh, they're all adults and or, or, in a, or surrounded by adults, and they deal with tough calls in their lives all the time, you know, how to get your mortgage and how to get your car or dealing with ups and downs. Why won't they be able to? They, they live with it. So I've always benefited that by turning around and saying, I can't do this for you. It's outside my expertise. And I think finally, I'm also trying with my other roles, trying to deconstruct the myth and the, and the, and the whole thing that doctors have built around themselves, that they're some sort of you know, ethereal human beings who <laughs> are here for to burn themselves at the altar. No, we're not. You know, we're, we're trained professionals, just like a fireman or a policeman and I'm trying to do my best. And sometimes I'll get it wrong. Sometimes I'll get it right. But uh, at least I want to portray across that I'm trying. I'm trying my best and we we'll see where we go from there. You know, it brings up an interesting point because I consider myself a very strong advocate with my doctors for myself and for my children, but I still, you know, you get intimidated. You you do, oh, yeah. I very much respect my doctors. Any advice for patients who who want to have a difficult conversation with their physician, who want to start broaching that, hey, hey, treat me like a partner and, and may not know how to start? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really difficult. It's really difficult to do that because I think this is why I feel, it's a bit like I always give the example of, let's say, uh, sexism. Now, it's not the it's not just the job of women to go and solve sexism, is it? I mean, it's men have got an equal part. You will not understand the nuance as a man, what a woman goes through, but you know when it's wrong and you can turn around and say, nah, guys, don't do that, right? So I think what I would encourage rather my clinical colleagues to say that, look, 
it's not tricky to sort of have that feedback and saying your approach may not be the right thing. And I think there's a younger generation coming through which does that. Um, so my advice to patients who would like to do that would be to, I think doctors feel very challenged as soon as you challenge them. It's an ego thing. <laughs> Don't forget that. We have been taught in medical school that we are the top of the top. There is nobody better than us, right? When you're told that for five years, seven years, eight years, 10 years of your life, that there was nobody better than you, it's very difficult to then sit in a space and if somebody challenges you to actually take that on board. So there is a bit of that complex that has happened over the course of time. So the way to approach that would be to probably do it from a slightly different angle rather than pointing out the mistake and say, what would you say? What do you think if we did this? Did you feel like? So I think you try and do that. There will be some people who are open to the idea of saying, I don't agree with that. And you go with it. But I think the biggest advice I can give is find an ally who's also a clinician who will do that for you. So in meetings, when I go to, I always see myself as that sort of advocacy role where you turn around and go like, nah, I don't agree with that. Because I know I've spoken to a lot of people who won't agree with that. So that is the sort of fine balance to strike. It will change. Doctors are changing. And, you know, if you've been long enough in the system, the 90s were different, 2000s were different, and now is different. But doctors are evolving slowly. Takes a long time to get your god get rid of your god complex. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, another question from one of my listeners who wanted to know if Brexit will or already has mm. had an impact on diabetes care or supplies. Um, no, it hasn't affected supplies because we actually knew there was going to be a problem, so we planned and we worked with the industry to make sure we had good supplies. I mean, there will always be teething trouble as we go along with this, but uh, no, uh, we don't expect. Uh, he says, fingers crossed. We have some plans in place uh, in case of anything, but Brexit is one of those political things in life, isn't it? So we just have to ride the storm with it as we go along. So This is an American-based uh, podcast, yeah. uh, mostly because I'm American. We do have mm. listeners all over the world, which I'm very, very grateful for. But our healthcare systems are so different. Mm. I, I'm curious if you have any advice or any lessons that you think we could learn from how how you all do it. Yeah, I mean, so I think... The debate about healthcare becomes incredibly emotive on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm. I think that's the problem. So when you turn around, people start saying, so for example, if you challenge the NHS, people go like, well, well you, you don't like the NHS because you want to make it privatized, do you? And you go like, no, not really. I'm just saying that there are gaps in the present system as we fund it. For example, we say it's equal to all, but it's not really if you come from a deprived community, right? Mm. And we've got issues with race. So as I've said, if you're a black child, your chance of getting a continuous glucose monitor is half of that of a white child. This is in the NHS, which professes to be equal to everybody. It's not, right? So the challenge is there, even however the funding is. I think my advice to in the US setting would be it's so vast and so big, taking aside the politics, which is so difficult to do, obviously. I think that too much attention is focused when it comes to chronic disease on the so the three parts, which I think of type one diabetes. I think I see it as Self-management, peer support, and access to trained professionals. That's the three yeah. things on which good type 1 diabetes care sits. And the U.S. system is incredibly geared about doing number three. So it makes it more and more expensive because we don't have any trained professionals. And so you end up having to really top load that bit. If you switched a lot of the attention to one and two, self-management with technology, peer support, you probably will have better outcomes. And I don't think it's about the make of the system, whether it's insurance-based or public funded, and that's where the politics comes in. It's about the switching of that mentality where you get peer support and self-management as being a main key focus and investment into. But the US system, partly the UK as well, but the US system hinges heavily on number three. And that's why you the costs are so out of control. Yeah. That's my view, at least. Yeah, well, we, and we've seen in, in our own experiences, and, and as people who listen to this podcast know, that, that peer community matters immensely with camps and communities and meetups and it's incredible. It makes such a difference. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned language matters. Can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit about that for people who aren't familiar? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a fair few versions of that. I mean, the principle of that was built in Australia in 2012. And it's, again, it's nothing dramatic. It's not, <laughs> I mean, it became, it basically saying, just be nice to people, you know. I think it got embroiled in this whole debate for a bit of time uh, because it was done in uh, the States. There was papers out on it that we picked up in the UK. Different countries have done it. And people get stuck up in the, Oh, is it, is it about calling somebody a diabetic or a person with diabetes? It's not. Lots of people don't mind being called diabetic. Some people do mind being called diabetic. That's not about that, what the document is about. The document is very, very simply about try to be less judgmental about people whose lives you don't live, right? If you're saying to somebody, 
oh, you know, I'm not sure you're, you, you should be doing that in the morning. Well, you don't know what life they live. You don't know that they're having to, you know, rush to drop off their kid to school and do this and do that. It's not easy to then go like, you should have a very structured breakfast and take your insulin on time. Well, that's fine for you to say, but that for that individual, they might have two kids to drop off and then go to work while trying to make sure, you know, their husbands had their whatever. I mean, it's, it's not easy. So I think that's what it's about. Don't, don't try and judge others whose lives you don't leave, uh, lead. So that, that was pretty much it. I think that the Libre goal mm. that you have, I know you're not done with and you wouldn't call it a, a, an ultimate success yet, mm. has been tremendous. Mm. What is next? Is it trying to get more pumps covered? Is it trying to get more equality, as you've already mentioned, across yeah. racial and economic lines? Closed loops, I think, um, I think is the is the is the next target. I think more more access to closed loops, more access to all the types of different loops that are available. And you touched upon it, irrespective of your deprivation ethnicity, that's going to be a huge focus going ahead. I want more people to have access to technology because I think technology is an enabler. It sort of ticks that box of self management and also encourages more peer support. So if we did that together well and did more standardized training for healthcare professionals. That, I think that's the sort of ultimate goal. But I think closed loops uh, are going to be the thing I suspect we focus and target on as we go ahead. Fabulous. Um, and I'll let you go. I know you got to run, but we are speaking during Diabetes Awareness Month, and you put out a video, very plain spoken as you do, saying basically, be nice, don't judge, don't be an idiot. And you have a two minute long video explaining right. this. What was the reaction? I mean, it's it's a very plain statement, but at the same time, it's quite blunt. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I see the debates between, and it's so silly, some of the stuff that goes on on social media and wider. And I, I can understand people do it because they have a book to sell or a podcast to plug or whatever they want to do, or Twitter likes. But simplistic narratives that never help people. You know, we could we could turn around and say, well, if you ate too many cakes, you'll have type 2 diabetes. There's not a single evidence base that will support that statement. Yes, people say that, right? You know, and I think that's the problem. And then that rolls into, how did your child have diabetes? Did you give them too many cakes? And you sit in there going like, what? how uneducated are you to even come up with a statement like that? And it's so frustrating to see that. So I think the reaction has been good. I mean, I've always been known for my, and I genuinely think when people don't know something, I'm very happy to explain it to them. In today's day and age, if people say that, oh, I didn't know that a type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, it's got nothing to do with your diet or your lifestyle, then I'm sorry, you are just uneducated. I mean, that's my bottom line to that. So you haven't even made the simple effort to open Google. So things like that. And I think that was the um, that was the idea of that. You know, it's, it's Diabetes Awareness Month, just be aware of different types, be nice to people, don't judge others. And you know, at least, you know, at least do some research. I mean, you've got Google on your smartphone. So yeah, simple things. Okay. Last question. You mentioned the Eternals. No spoilers. I haven't seen it, but I know you're a big Marvel fan. How was the movie? Oh, it was good. I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's as a standalone, it works really well. And my only big tip also is stay for the after credits. Very good. Especially the last one. Very, very good. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks very much. Pleasure. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information at diabetes-connections.com. Of course, there's always a transcript as well. I will link up how to follow Dr. Carr on social media. I highly recommend his Twitter feeds. And he is just very informative, very straightforward. And he's always willing to admit when he makes a mistake or something funny happens. I mean, he's just, let's face it, he's just a human being online, which is why I think so many of us respond to him so well. But I liked a lot of the advice he gave there for us to take to our doctors. We really have to be straightforward with them. So many times they don't even realize what they're doing or how they're talking to us. Sometimes they do and they're, they're just jerks. But most of the time, I think they want to have a good relationship with us. At least that has been my experience. There's only been one doctor in my, my experience. I'm not talking about Benny because we've been very lucky with him. There's only been one doctor that I have fired. And I fired him from my hospital room because, oh my gosh, was he talking down to me. <laughs> so... Don't be afraid to do it. All right, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And we were watching TV the other night. My husband and I are really into The Expanse now, which is a sci-fi show that's been out for a while. We are totally binging it. We're going through every season. So we're watching that. And the Dexcom went off, uh, the alert on my phone. And Benny was upstairs in his room. And, you know, for some reason, it took me back to the days when we basically had blood sugar checks on a timer. 
if you're of a certain age, you remember this, we would check doing a finger stick the same time every day at home and at school and whenever extra we needed to. It's really amazing to think about how much our diabetes management has changed with share and follow. I didn't stop the movie to check on him. I knew what was going on. I mean, I could decide whether to text him or go up and help out. For this instance, I did absolutely nothing because I, I didn't need to. Using the share and follow apps have really helped us talk less about diabetes, which I never thought would happen with a teenager. Trust me, Benny loves that part too. That's what's so great about the Dexcom system. I think for the caregiver or the spouse or the friend, you can help the person with diabetes manage in the way that works for your individual situation. Internet connectivity is required to access Dexcom Follow. Separate follow app is required. Learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. If you're listening as this episode goes live, happy Hanukkah. We will be marking uh, night three as you're listening. Again, if you're listening when the episode first airs. And boy, it's early this year and my daughter's already back in school, but that's how it goes. I hope your latkes are yummy and your Hanukkah guilt is delicious and you're not stressing out too much about diabetes and you're able to enjoy what the holiday has to offer. Looking ahead, I mean, what am I going to say? Here we are, December. Oh my goodness. So we've got some great shows coming up. We've got a conversation next week with the folks from Convitec. They make all of the insets except for Omnipod. But if you use a Tandem, Medtronic, Ypsomed, uh, those pumps, they make your insets. So we had a really good conversation about how to make those better. Some good information for the community from them. And I'm, I'm hoping that'll be an ongoing conversation. And then we have a lot of good stuff in the works for the rest of this year going into January. The only thing I would ask is if you have listened to this far and you are not signed up for our newsletter, please make sure to do that. I send out an email every week along with the show. And quite often there is more information in there than just that week's episode. We do surveys, we do research opportunities that I get from companies. There's a lot of info in that. And as we move forward into next year and I'm branching off into other projects, I'm going to be using that newsletter to communicate more and more about things, not just the podcasts that I think are of your interest, but I don't spam you or anything dumb like that. So go ahead. You can go to diabetes-connections.com. A little pop-up will come up. If you don't see it, just scroll down. There's a little newsletter thingy that'll help you sign up there. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. We are back on track for our newscast this week. So I will see you back here Wednesday on Facebook or YouTube Live for In the News. And then on Friday, we turn that into an audio-only podcast, whatever works better for you. Feel free to join me in whatever way is the best. I'm Stacey Sims. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.